you have your Bibles, I want you to open with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And I want to ask you a question that Jesus asked. Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? You know, first little thing a lot of people say, well, he's the son of God. That's true. And that's what Peter said in a sense, but Peter said it different. Peter said it with an understanding. Peter said it with an understanding, a revelation that God had given to him of who Jesus really was. And there's more in Peter's answer than just the son of God. If you would honor the reading of God's word and stand with me or be able, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 19. And when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, some others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Then Jesus said to them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to Simon, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Listen closely, church. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Father, I thank you today for your word. And I thank you for your presence and your spirit. And Father, I thank you for who you are. You are more. You are the Son of God. You are more, Father, than we ever dreamed. And Father, I'm so thankful. And I love you and praise you today for your presence and your spirit that we have felt in this place. And I ask now that you would touch each and every one and open our ears to hear your word and to receive it into our hearts. We ask it all in Christ Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The story here is such a great story in the Bible. And it is such a powerful question that is asked by Jesus himself. Jesus had withdrew along with his disciples. And he was actually in the last weeks of his, or last months of his life. Because uh, he was about uh, three months from his crucifixion. And he knew that his time was coming in. And when he would leave Caesarea Philippi, he would actually begin his journey back across through Galilee and uh, uh, going back through there and through Jericho and into Jerusalem for that final day and that final trip. And as he was uh, finishing this, he had taken them uh, to this place where he asked them this question, who do you say I am? In verse 15, it was demanding because it required an answer. And the answer would actually determine a, a person's eternal destination. How a person answers that question determines whether they will spend eternity in heaven with him or in hell. It's very simple and very plain. The question is still being asked of God to, by God today of the church and of the world, who do you say I am? And I'm afraid many times we really don't know how to answer that question. We don't really recognize uh, who he is today. When someone asks, if, if someone come up on the street and asks you, who is Jesus? Your immediate response, oh, the son of God, but is that all? How would you really respond to that question if they were sincerely looking and wanting to know who Jesus is? Uh, I, I, I had an opportunity to talk to someone uh, a week ago, and, and, uh, and they, they knew, they said, I've seen you. You're that pastor over at the, that church down there on the, on the interstate. And I said, yes, that's me. And he said, he said, 
said, you know, he said, I've never went to church. And we got to talking for a minute. And he said, I don't know all this stuff. He said, I've heard about your Jesus, but I don't really know him. And he said, uh, I, what's so special about your church or what you believe? There's churches everywhere. And everybody has different beliefs and different faith. And I said, the only thing I can tell you is that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. And I can tell you that if you ever come to know him, you'll never be the same again. And I begin to talk with him a little bit about who Jesus was. And I begin to realize something that many times there are people who have heard the name of Jesus. And there are many people who have said the name of Jesus, but they really do not know who he is. And they do not know how to ask that question. And I wanted to look at this here today. And, and as God was dealing in my heart, and I, the first thing I wanted to look at was where was this question asked? And why was it asked there? And the Bible plainly says that this is one time that it very it detailed about where he was in this moment. And it said, and when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was one of the most wicked places uh, upon the face of the earth in the days of Christ. Uh, it was the center, it had been the center all the way back from the time of the Mede and Persians empire. It had been the center all the way back from the Babylonian empire. It had been that their seed all the way back even as far as the Egyptians uh, empire that the, the, uh, the, the Caesarea Philippi who was not called that at that time, but that place had been the center of Baal worship. Baal worship is Baal, the late, the liar, the tongue of thieves. He is Satan himself. It was a worship, and, and there were over 14 temples in and around this area where we're talking about. My wife and I, whenever we was in Israel, had an opportunity to visit Caesarea Philippi and see the remains of what was there. And it wasn't destroyed until somewhere around 38 AD. D whenever uh, uh, Tyrus Tiberius was uh, uh, the emperor of Rome and he went in there and they were fighting wars and many of it, much of it was destroyed and then the rest of it was broken down and destroyed when uh, uh, Alexander became uh, the ruler and emperor when he tried to make Christianity a world religion. And it was during this time here that Caesarea Philippi, this evil place, uh, there was one place in particular that was stood out above all and it was the Temple of Pan. The Temple of Pan, the half man, half goat uh, of fear and fright. Right. Um, he was depict, often displayed. You see him in pictures of playing a flute uh, and uh, uh, with women around him. Pan was born uh, half man, half goat, and he often uh, is a representation of that as Satan himself. Uh, and they believe that Pan came out of a cavern there. And inside that temple, there was a, a, a place there, a cavern that went down uh, many leagues. It was seen to be bottomless, uh, and it was actually human sacrifice was take place there children would be thrown in to this pit. Uh, uh, people would buy slaves and bring them and kill them and throw them or, or take and throw them into this pit. Uh, and the water that ran out of Caesarea Philippi, if the blood was seen in the waters, it was believed that Pan had heard your, the prayer of the one who had made the sacrifice. Uh, Pan was nothing more than a prediction of Satan or the devil himself. Uh, also there was a temple, a structure that had been built about 20 years prior to Christ. It was a gleaming white marble temple that had been built to worship Caesar Augusta. Herod the Great had built this temple in honor of Caesar Augusta and he had bestowed, a, a, when a Caesar had bestowed upon him more ruling and more uh, a power and so he built it there and this place was known to worship Caesar and to worship Pan and like I said other 14 other deities or temples uh, that had their worships there in that city. It was a most evil and most wicked place you could find during the time of Christ other than being in Rome itself. This place was wicked. This place was evil. This place had stuff going on that you would not believe that would shock you even today in our world and in our lifetime. This place was a place of such evil that it's a wonder that Christ would go there and take his disciples there because there was things that were going on on the street, in the street, in the open that would uh, Sodom and Gomorrah would look like and said, my Lord, Lord, how can this be allowed to do? And God even said that this place would one day be destroyed. In fact, the name of it was changed to Caesarea Philippi, which Caesarea means Caesar's town, a place to worship him. And the and Philip, the son of Herod the Great, is the one who made it what it was 
was in the day of Christ, uh, he named it Philippi after himself uh, because he said, I am a worshiper of Caesar. And so Caesarea Philippi came into existence. Uh, and Jesus took his disciples to this very wicked place, this very evil place, uh, this place of, uh, 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 of such uh, 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 of, of disgust and evil and, and, and false gods and false worship. In fact, uh, it is noted, uh, uh, Josephus, uh, the historian of the days of Christ, actually notes and writes that every form of worship that was committed in Caesarea Philippi except for the worship of God, Jehovah, or his son Christ. Think about that. Every type of worship was done there except the worship of God, Jehovah, and his son, Jesus Christ. That's what Josephus said. He said there was no worship of God there. There was no worship of Jesus there. No Christianity had come into this place. And here Jesus comes and he brings his disciples into this place called Caesarea Philippi. And he's standing there and the reason it was so profound is that the temple of Pan that worshipped human sacrifice where that cavern was, they believed that was the very gates of Hades or the gates of hell and that had been believed for many years uh, all the way back to the Greek, Persian and Babylonian empires uh, that was a belief there and many had come there to worship the devil, worship Satan, worship uh, Hades, uh, the, any gods of death that was worshipped there, Hermeleses uh, they would come there and worship them in this place because they believed there was an opening into the underworld into Hades or into hell in that very place and so there's a significance there you have to understand that most of the known world world at that time really believed that this is the place, uh, the opening, the gates to hell itself. And so when Jesus came there, he brought his disciples, all of them, and he stands there looking back at the temple of Pan, where the gates of hell was, and, and the temple of Caesar that uh, was before the opening, and he watched as they were doing all this wicked, evil things. People are being sacrificed. Uh, all kind of different uh, debaucheries are taking place there. And he's standing here, and as if you would look at those doors back there, or the gates uh, of that temple, he was standing there before them, and he simply asked them, who do men say that I am? And they looked at him, and they began to say, well, some say you're John the Baptist. And that's amazing, because how could he be John the Baptist when he was baptized by John the Baptist? Do you remember that? Him and John the Baptist lived at the same time, and John the Baptist had only been killed about a year prior to this, so how could he say he's John the Baptist, but yet people were saying, oh, he's John the Baptist. Uh, and then he said, well, some say you're Elijah, but he wasn't Elijah either. And some said he was Jeremiah, but he wasn't Jeremiah. And some said one of the other prophets. They began to name different ones. But Jesus was not any of these. Uh, they wanted to predict him as somebody else. Uh, they wanted to point him out as being somebody else. Uh, even though they picked some good men, like John the Baptist, who was a man of God, who preached uh, uh, repentance uh, and preached the baptism and salvation that was good and even though Elijah was a great prophet and Jeremiah and the other prophets were great men of God who had brought a word at a needed time Jesus was not any of them he didn't listen to me they did not hold a candle to who he was but yet everybody wanted to put him into that category with them they wanted him to be like John the Baptist they wanted him to be like Elijah they wanted him to be like Jeremiah honey I want to tell you the world today they they want to put Jesus in a box somewhere and they want him to be like all the other gods. I tell you it burns me up. I got an issue with these people that want to get up on the news and on TV and say we're all going to the same place. It doesn't matter who you worship. We're all going to. Honey it matters. It matters who you believe in because I got news for you. We're not all going to the same place. There ain't no other way to get to heaven except through Jesus Christ. But yet the world today would want to tell you, oh, but he's the same. I heard a commentary on the news, and I know they're doing it because it's got to be politically correct. They're trying to keep the peace with everybody. They're trying to make everybody happy. And they said, we want to pray for you in the name of Jesus, in the name of Allah, in the name of Buddha. And I got news for you. You can't put Jesus with Allah. You can't put Jesus with Buddha. You can't put Jesus with another one. Honey, I want to tell you something. My Jesus is different than all the rest of them. You can Call out these names, but they're not like my Jesus. 
The world today wants to level the playing field. They want to make them all the same. Glory to God. Today in Europe, there is a temp, there is a, an area today that it is actually was completed last year in Europe today of the triune churches. It has got a Catholic church or Episcopal, Catholic Episcopalian church in it. It's got a, a Muslim church in it. And it's got a Jewish church in it. And you know what they're doing? They're trying to bring all of the religions together. And they you know what they did? They said, we want to show the world that all religions are one and we can get together. I want to tell you something, church. That's a sign of the end time of the Antichrist coming. You better wake up and realize what's going on around you. Honey, the world's getting ready. The world's trying to say there's one church and one group and they're all the same. But I got news for you. When my Jesus came, he said, I'm not going to come for anybody. I'm coming because I am the son of the living God and there's not going to be another way it's going to be through me. I'm the only way to achieve the, to the Father. you got to believe in me. See, they got so much junk today. They're, everything they do today, it aggravates me. It aggravates me because they want to downplay who he is. They want to make him like everybody else. They want to pretend that everybody else is just as good as him. But I'm going to tell you something, church. You can buy into that if you want to, and you will not make heaven your home. I want to tell you there's only one way to make heaven your home, and that's to go through him. Jesus himself said, let not your heart be troubled when you see these things coming about. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. I'm telling you in St. John chapter 14 he makes it plain. He said I'm the way, I'm the truth and I'm the life and no man goes to the Father except through me. We need to understand he went to the most wicked place of his time and he looked at him and said who, do everybody say, who does everybody say I am? And they began to hear just what the world's doing today in its wickedness and its perversion. They tried to equal him down to everybody else. They tried to make him the same as everybody else. And Jesus standing there, kind of shaking his head at him and looks at him. He says, but who? <laughs> now I got you there. He says, but who do you say that I am? Listen to me. He asked them a pointed question. Glory to God. He looked at him and said, but who do you? Who do you? Who do you say I am? Well, let me tell you something. People look at them and all the time talk about old Peter. But I want to tell you something. This was not a Peter answer. According to the scripture, this was a Holy Spirit answer. Oh, wait a minute, preacher. The Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out yet. Honey, the Holy Spirit was already working. Glory to God. Just because the day of Pentecost wasn't there doesn't mean they didn't have the Holy Spirit working in them. Go back and read your Bible. The Bible said that whenever Mary came and told her cousin Elizabeth what had happened to her by the Gabriel angel, how she had she had conceived from the Holy Spirit and was carrying the Son of God. The Bible said uh, Elizabeth, six months pregnant, six months pregnant, the baby leaped in her womb uh, full of the Holy Ghost uh, and fire. I want to tell you, John came out full of the Spirit of God. And all of a sudden you find this story here. But who do you say I am? You see, everybody's trying to put him as somebody else. And Peter looked at him and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now you've got to look at this answer. You see, Jesus said, now how do you know it's of the Spirit? Read it again. Jesus said unto him in verse 17, you can put it back up on the screen if you got it. In verse 17, he said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Blessed are you, son of Jonah. <laughs> he said, For flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. <laughs> you didn't get this information from some man, and you didn't get this information from your own flesh. This didn't come from within you, from blood. This came from the Holy Spirit. He said, But my Father, but my Father in heaven, glory to God. Can I tell you today that Father sent 
the Spirit down to speak through Peter and Peter gave a revelation to all of those disciples and all of a sudden they had something that they knew something that they had never known before. Who was it? Well, I want to take just a minute. I'm going to tell you, I struggle because I was telling my wife last night, I had some pictures I wanted to show you of Caesarea Philippi and pictures that we took when we was over in Israel. And But I said, I ain't got time for all that because I'm going to have to work to get this one down. Because if I preach all of this one this morning, y'all might be here till 3 o'clock today. Glory to God. Because I want to tell you, when I answer the question, who is Jesus? There's a whole lot of answering to give. Glory to God. Because I got news for you. He is more than just saying the Son of God. Honey, everybody knows he's the Son of God. But do you know who he really is? Well, the first thing I want to tell you, let me tell you who I believe he is. Number one, he is God. Can somebody say amen? I said he is God. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. In John 1 and 1, the Bible said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in the beginning, he was with God, and all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. And in him is life, and the life is the light of men, and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. Can I tell you who he is? He's God. Who is Jesus? In John 1 and 10, he said he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He's God. In verse 14, it said, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is God. In Colossians, Paul said, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, and for by him all things were created, and that are in the heavens and in the earth, the visible and the invisible, the thrones and dominions and the principalities and powers. All things were created through him and for him. He belong, He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Can I tell you today, he is God. Who is Jesus? Who is he? Can I tell you, he is the Messiah, our Savior. When they said, thou art the Christ, in the Hebrew language, they were saying, thou art the Messiah. That's what Christ meant, Messiah. He said, thou art the Messiah, our Savior. In John 1, 11 and 13, he came into his own, but his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, he gave them the right to become the children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of his blood, but nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Can I tell you, John 3, 16, can you get any better? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen to what Jesus said. But God did not send me into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. For he who believes in me is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned condemned already because he did not believe in the name of the only begotten son of God. Listen, he has delivered us from power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son of his love whom we have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. Does it get any plainer than that? Paul said, I want to tell you who he is. He is the savior of all mankind. There is no other way by which man can be saved than the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody give him praise. Who is Jesus? I want to tell you who he is. The third thing I want to tell you is he's the head of the church. Woo. Now better pray for me. I might get in trouble here. He's the head of the church. You want to know what's wrong with our churches in America today? We got too many churches that's taken Jesus out of the headship and they trying to run the church themselves. Let me tell you something. We need to go back to our roots and we need to remember who we are. We are the church of the living God and he is the head of the church. Can somebody say amen? 
You know why the world doesn't know who he is? You want to know why the, uh, the church can't answer who he is? It's because we have forgotten who he is. You know why? When you don't know who the head is, honey, you will wander around and follow anything. Honey, there's got to be a head. I, and you need to know who the head is. Can somebody say amen? Some of y'all looking at me like you don't know what in the world I'm talking about. How many of you ever played follow the leader? My wife and me is the only ones ever played follow the leader. Man, y'all are privileged people. When I was growing up, we didn't have Nintendo and Xbox and PlayStation. My Lord, we didn't have, the only TV we had was a black and white that had three channels. And I was the remote. Yeah, it didn't have no, but if that daddy wanted to chant, Nathan turned to chant, I was the remote. And let me, you think that's funny? Let me tell you about it. If it wasn't coming in good and they were trying to watch Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, hello? Any of y'all remember that? Or the Lawrence Welk Show, any of y'all remember that one? If we was watching something like that and they couldn't get it, you know what? I had to go outside. And we had an antenna on a pole that went up beside the trailer. And Daddy would say, turn that antenna. And I'd turn it. And he'd say, no, you turned it too far. Turn it back a little bit the other way. And I'd turn it back the other way. And I had to keep turning it until the signal came in. And when the signal came in, glory to God. That's wherever we got to watch TV. Let me tell you something. We didn't have all that stuff. When we were kids, we had to go. I had a, I had, I had a, I had a cell phone when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I sure did. It was two tin cans with a string between it. And if you ain't never played with one of those, you don't know what playing with a cell phone is. That's right. We get that thing, you stretch that string tight. And we get out there between those two tin cans and stretch it tight. And me and my sister, or me and my brother, and we could talk to one another through the tin can. See, we didn't have what you had here. So when we went outside, we had to play games. We had to play games. I, I used to shoot marbles. Hello? Anybody know what shooting the marbles about? I had me an Aggie marble. Glory to God. <laughs> the Aggie marbles uh, were good. Glory to God. Uh, you could shoot those Aggie marbles. Uh, that was a big round one like that. And if you got a steel one, one of those ball bears, woo, you were set to go. That was playing back then. And we'd draw a circle and put the marbles in. And if you was good, you'd walk away with the most marbles. Hello. Glory to God. Uh, when I got a little bit older, glory to God, uh, we would play. And, and, and we whoever won would walk away with the most nickels uh, until I got caught and got my tail tore up. Uh, you see, we that was. Uh, growing, that was what we played uh, and did. Uh, but we'd go out there and we'd play games like tag, you're it. Uh, and we'd play games like hide and go seek. Uh, and then we'd play games like uh, Red Rover, Red Rover. Any of y'all remember those things? We'd play games like follow the leader, glory to God. But the game about follow the leader is we'd get a bunch of the kids in the neighborhood together and if we get enough of us to play it, it was fun. But the thing is you had to follow the leader. And if the leader wasn't, <laughs> wasn't smart, you didn't up in a mess trying to follow that leader. Here's the problem with the church. We've taken Jesus out as the head and we've tried to follow our own leadership and without Jesus and the church is getting to be in a mess today. Why? Because we need to get out of the way and make Jesus the head of the church again and say, hey, I'm not going to follow anybody but him. Can somebody say amen? You know what he said? He said, when you see these things happening, look up for your redemption. Draw with nigh. You see, he's the head of the church. Well, the Bible doesn't really say that. Oh, yes, it does. In Colossians 1.18, it said, and he is the head of Jesus, is the head of the body. The church is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead. That is, that it, that is in all things, Jesus may have preeminence. Look in Ephesians 1.22. And Jesus put all things under his feet and gave him head over all things to the church. This is what he says uh, in Ephesians. He said, uh, or 5.23, he says, Husbands, be the head of your wife, uh, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Glory to God. Guys, don't get the big head on that. Right? You are supposed to be the head of your wife, as Christ is the head of the church and the Savior. It means you're supposed to be taking care of her, and you're supposed to be providing for her, and you're supposed to be leading her to Jesus. Let me tell you something today. He said, Jesus said, you call me teacher and Lord, and so you say well, for I am your 
leader. I am your teacher. I am your Lord. I want to tell you something, Timothy. Paul said there is one God and one mediator between God and man. And that man is Jesus Christ who gave himself ransom for all and to be testified in due time. I want to tell you something, church. It's time we get the head back in the church. His name is Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? He is the giver of life. You know what the Bible said? He said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He who believes on me, though he may die, yet he will live. Jesus said in verse 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goeth to the Father except by me. In John 10, 10, he said, the thief cometh to steal and to kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He is the giver of life. If your life's in a mess today, I want to tell you why. It's because you don't know who Jesus is. But if Jesus is first in your life, if Jesus is your head, if Jesus is your Savior, if Jesus is your God, then Jesus will give you life. I'm a, Jesus is my victory. Justin, you better come help me. Jesus is my victory. I got to, I'm only on page, what is that? Page three of 29. I told y'all, this one's a long one. You better hope I can wind it up. Jesus is my victory. You didn't hear me. When somebody asks you, do you, who is Jesus? Who do you say Jesus is? He's my God, number one. Number two, he is my Savior. <laughs> Glory to God. I want to tell you something. He is all these things to me. But I want to tell you, he is my victor. He is my victory. Glory to God. I have victory through him. You know why? Look what he told him. He said, I'm going to tell you something, Peter. He said, you're not going to be just called Simon Bar-Jonah. You're not going to be called Simon, son of Jonah anymore. You're going to be called Peter. And upon this rock. Now, there's a lot of people misunderstand and misinterpret the scripture. Because Peter or Petra means rock. They think he was talking about he was going to build his church home, Peter. Mm -mm. That's not what he was saying. You got to read with understanding. Pay attention to the scripture. He's already told him. He said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. This knowledge that you have, this is what I'm going to build my church on. This knowledge that my Father gave you. What knowledge? That thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of the living God. That's right, Peter. That knowledge. On that rock, I'm going to build my church. Now, you got to remember, he's standing in Caesarea Philippi. Glory to God. And everybody believes that's the entrance to hell. So when he looks at him and said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. I'm going to build my church upon this rock and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He is church. His church. He gave them the victory right then and there. He said, I'm going to give you victory and the, the hell itself ain't going to be able to stop you. Now listen to me. People misunderstand. We think that means about the enemy. Listen, gates do one of two things. They open, they close. They do not change locations. Y'all didn't hear me. If I want those doors there open, guess what? Open! I don't have enough breath in me to blow them open. I don't have enough noise in me to shout them open. You know why? They're closed. And they're going to stay closed unless I do something. I got, if I want those doors to change, I got to get out, out of my place. I got to move out of my comfort zone. I got to go where they're at. Y'all ain't hearing me. Y'all ain't getting this yet, evidently. Somebody look at what I'm doing. You got to go to where the doors are, where the gates are. And if I want them to change, look at here. I got to push on them. I got to hold them. Hell, are you with me? If I let go, they're going to close. See, watch. Mm-hmm. So if I want to change it, I got to get out here. I got to get in the way. And they're going to keep on changing unless I tear them off, unless I get them blocked, or unless I get somebody else. Brother Mike, you want to help me? Come here. See, it's kind of hard for me to hold them both. You get that one hold open. 
Look at that. But now they're wide open. Glory to God. I'm about to preach out. I'm about to run around this church for y'all. Y'all ain't got it yet. When he said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, he didn't mean that hell was going to come after the church. We know the enemy is going to come after the church. But what he meant was that hell couldn't stop us from going after him. Y'all didn't get it. He said the gates of hell, they can't stop you. They can't prevail against my church. When the church gets enough of the power of God to know who he is, we won't let the world take our family anymore. We'll go to hell and we'll say, get out of the way. I'm taking my family back. I'm taking my marriage back. I'm taking my children back. I'm taking my health back. I refuse to let you prevail. The word prevail in the Greek language, Stephen, I love this. It means to stop. Brother Jeremy, they don't get it. Brother Jeremy, I might get out and run you around the church the way I'm feeling right now. That, you'd know that'd be the Holy Ghost. Jeremy, prevail means to stop. Brother Joseph, to stop. Hell has been trying to stop the church from moving forward ever since Christ left this world. But Christ said, listen to me. When I leave, I'm not going to leave you powerless. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm not going to leave you without strength. I'm going to send to you another comforter, which is the Holy Ghost and fire. And when the Holy Ghost and fire comes, you can't overcome hell. If God be for us. Now, who is Jesus? Number one, he's my God. Yeah, yeah. I said, who is Jesus? No, he's my God. If God be for us, who can be against us? All but pastor. Man, I, I love God, but I'm struggling. Get in line. I'm about to get in trouble. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of people saying, well, I would, but it's so hard. I got so much against me. Get in line. Get in line. Everybody's got problems. Everybody's got troubles. Everybody's fighting a battle. Honey, people in here with sickness, people in here with cancer, people in here with lost children, people in here with marriages in trouble, people in here their jobs are in trouble, people in here in financial struggles. Let me tell you something. I, everybody's got problems. And Jesus said, listen, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, but be of good cheer, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world, and greater is he that that is in you than he that is in the world. Stop saying, I got problems. Start saying, I got victory through Jesus. Because if he is your savior, if he's your God, if he is your Savior, those two right there, are you with me? Jesus did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Stand with me all over this house. Who is Jesus? so much Jesus is all through the Bible that's the crazy thing so many people in the world when they say they don't realize 
He's been there from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, with God. He was in the beginning with God and was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. That's Jesus. In Genesis, God said, let us, plural, let us create man in our image. I'm about, boy, y'all might have to say, I'm about to get aside again. Number one, sorry, he made man male. That tells me that God's a man. That tells me the Son's a man. That tells me the Holy Spirit is a man. Or at least in form in that aspect. Ladies, I love you and I am so thankful for you. You see, my wife, my wife didn't come from my foot to be under me. And she didn't come from my head to be over me. She didn't come from my back to be behind me. And she didn't come from my front to lead me. She didn't come from my hands to serve me. But God took a rib <laughs> for her to walk beside me. And I'm so glad when he made man, he made a male, and he created him in his image. He said, let us create him in our image. Woo, glory to God. But when he, and he made us from mud. Y'all didn't get that. They read the Bible. <laughs> he made us from mud and dirt. Look how we turned out, guys. But when he made the woman, he didn't go back to the mud and dirt. He took a rib from the man and made her. So, ladies, you wouldn't be here without us. Say, man, so get off your high horse. We might have come from mud, but you came from us. But you know what he did? He put them together. And he said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Because he knew that Adam and Steve couldn't do it. He knew Eve and Angie couldn't do it. He needed a man and a woman. Now, out of my rabbit hole. You see, in Genesis, he was the creator. That was him. And he was the ram in the thicket. In Exodus, he was the bush that did not burn. He was the Passover lamb. <laughs> Glory to God. That's what he was going to be in, in the New Testament. And he said, I am the I am. In Leviticus, he is our high priest and the covenant between God and man. In Numbers, he is the sanctuary and the sepulcher. In Deuteronomy, he is Moses' voice and our everlasting father. In Joshua, he is salvation's choice. In Judges, he is the lawgiver and the judgment of God. In Ruth, he is the kinsman redeemer and our surety. In 1 Samuel, he is the trusted prophet and the stone in a sling. In 2 Samuel, Samuel, he is our rock and our fortress. In 1 Kings, he is the fire that fell from heaven and the still small voice. In 2 Kings, he is the oil and the flower that never runs out. In 1 Chronicles, he's the prayer of Jabez. In 2 Chronicles, he's the sovereign leader. In Ezra, he is the true and faithful scribe and a wheel that's in a wheel. He is xenolithic. Glory to God. My Lord. In Nehemiah, he is the builder of broken walls and lives. In Esther, he is the Mordecai's courage and the unspeakable gift. In Job, he is the timeless redeemer. In Psalms, he is the songs of worship. He is the good shepherd. He is our strong and mighty tower. In Proverbs, he is wisdom's cry and the seeker of God. In Ecclesiastes, he's the preacher's voice and a time and season for all things. In the Psalms of Solomon, he is the lover 
river's dream and the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon. In Isaiah, he is Emmanuel, God with us, a wounding for our transgressions, a bruising for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace, the stripes of our healing, the lifting up on eagle's wings, and the prince of peace, mighty God and wonderful counselor. Can somebody give him praise? I'm telling you who Jesus is. Can I tell you today? He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. He is our King. He's the Lamb of God. He's the one that was given for us that we could be redeemed unto the Father. And one day, He's coming back to get us. Glory to God. Give Him praise. I got a whole, I go through all 66 books of the Bible. In 66 books of the Bible, there's a reference to who Jesus is in every one of them. Today, I can tell you who he is. He is my everything. He's my everything. And Satan, when he thought he could stop me, Jesus said, son, I'm not through with you yet. Glory to God. And when I walked through that wilderness, he was there with me. I'm telling you, Jesus is my everything. Do you know him? Who do you say Jesus is? Will you bow your heads and pray, Father, right now? Lord, I thank you. Father, I thank you because you're my everything. You're my Lord, my King. Oh, God, you are so much. Father, time will not permit me to tell what you are and who you are. You are our strength and our shield. You're our holy one and just one. You're the pleading for revival, the consuming fire. You're the restorer of lost heritages. Oh, God, you are the former and the latter rain. Father, you are the refining fire and the purifier. You're the tithe and the giver. You're the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. You're everything. You're everything, Lord. And God, if I had all day, I could not begin to tell what you are to me. And Father, I pray for every person here under the sound of my voice. For today, you are everything they need. And I ask, Father, touch every heart and every life that is here. With every eye closed and every head bowed, I want to ask you this morning, if someone asked you, who is Jesus, how would you answer? Do you know him as your everything? Do you know him as your Lord and your Savior? If you're here this morning, and maybe things aren't really right in your life, I'm not going to embarrass you, but you'd say, Pastor, I know him, but I don't know him like I need to. If you ask me who he is, if he was coming back today for you, do you know who he is? Would you be ready? If you're not sure, I want you to slip your hand up. I want to pray for you. I want to give you an opportunity. I'm not going to hold you. I want to tell you something. Don't leave here if you don't know who he is. If you don't really know him like you need to. If you're not sure. All right. This morning, I want to give you an opportunity. If you want to pray. Pastor, I know him. But I have forgotten. And I just need to, I need to remind myself that he's my everything in my life. That he's my restorer. He's my victory. He's my Savior. He's my God. He's my everything. Pastor, I just need to let him know. Will you pray with me? I want to give you an opportunity. Father, right now, God, every heart that is here, Father, I pray for those who may not be ready and may not know you. I pray for salvation. Father, you are the Savior. Father, you were more than just the Messiah. You were the salt of the earth, the light of this world. 
You're the bridegroom coming. You're the message of the Father. You're the one who forgives sins. You are the Great Commission. You're the way, the truth, and the life. Father, you're the prodigal returning. You're the touch of the hem of his garment. Father, you are the word of God, the bread of life, the lamb of God, the resurrection and the life. You are all these things, God. And today, Father, I want to make sure we know you. So if there's one here, Father, that doesn't know you as all these things, I pray, God, that you would let them know you today. I pray that you would forgive them of their sins. I pray, Father, that you would go into their hearts and redeem them, renew them, and touch them. I pray that you would bless your people today, Father. Touch us with your presence and your life. And Father, we'll give you the praise and we'll give you the honor and glory for it all in Christ Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. What a wonderful time we had today here at the Golden Isles Church of God. I want to personally thank you for joining and tuning in today on our live stream. Thank you for your giving and your support. If you have a prayer request, we hope that you'll leave it in the comments because we have a prayer team standing by that wants to join with you in prayer. We want to thank you once again for allowing us to minister to you and your family. And we pray that God would bless you and your household. I hope you have a wonderful week and I hope that you'll come Come back and tune in next week here at the Golden Isles Church of God. Take care and God bless.